So it's time for another review of the week and um, there's two versions of this review. One's the one you might be watching and the other one's the one you might be listening to. The audio is obviously the same but uh, if you are listening to the podcast one and you want to see what I'm talking about then take a look at the YouTube version. Now the big news obviously is that we've had a huge amount of rain and that means that all of the beds are lovely and well hydrated now. And actually I managed to fill all of my storage water tanks in October. And I've got a bit of space in the capture tanks but basically I'm completely full up. I was actually down on the allotment on a lovely sunny Sunday moving all the water with a little pump from the capture tanks into the storage tanks and there was just this most stunning rainbow that uh, just spanned the green drive. It was really nice. Unfortunately, when I arrived at the plot, all that rain had a lot of high winds associated with it. And I found that one of my low tunnels was pretty badly damaged, actually. Now, it was the oldest low tunnel, and it had it was probably about five years old, something like that. The polythene was all ripped. And when I started to see if I could repair it with polythene repair tape, the the plastic was just breaking up in my hands. So I think that, uh, you know, the the days are numbered really for all those low tunnels. So I've bought new polythene for all of them and later on in the week uh, I repaired the first of them. For now though, the others seem fine. So uh, I've just bought some spare polythene so I can repair them if necessary. I think it was about £10 per low tunnel for the polythene, which isn't really that much of an investment for something that's going to last five, six years, something like that. Got to make sure though when you get the polythene, uh, sorry, you get the polythene that you get stuff that's been UV stabilised because obviously it's outside all the time. And if you just get standard polythene, it pretty much disintegrates after a year. So one of the things I've always been asked for are book recommendations uh, related to gardening. Um, I'm quite an avid reader. I think I probably read about a book a week, and you know I don't know maybe ten of those perhaps are gardening books. And so I've got quite a nice collection of books that I've read over the last few years that are all logged in my reading database. Uh, So I created a view onto that database for you, which is just the gardening and self-sufficiency books. And I put a few words in there to describe, you know, what I think about that book uh, and gave it a rating. So if you're interested in that, there's a link to that in the description below. So I've actually been feeling very well this week. As part of my kind of autoimmune condition that I've got, I get this horrendous rash, kind of all body rash, um, and it just comes on from nowhere. And I think it's because I get insect bites. And when they reach a sort of threshold value, like one insect bite is no problem, but maybe if I get three on the same day, it triggers this autoimmune reaction. I get this huge rash, like all up my legs, my chest, everywhere. And it's just incredibly itchy, so I don't sleep very well just a bit demoralizing really. So it's really nice that at this time of year, there's something to look forward to in addition to just planting the allotment and stuff. And that is sunrises and sunsets. Finally, they're timed at the right time for me to see them in the morning and in the afternoons. And honestly, it really does lift my spirits. We in St. Anne's here, we're like, I think one of the best places for sunrise and sunset lovers. Um, we can see the sun rise and the sunset from the beach and it's just it's just fantastic. So I'll put a few pictures of uh, the sunrises uh, from this week and I'll try and get you some good sunset ones in the next few weeks as well. Um, I'll pop one up actually now but it's not from this year, it's from last year. So I did manage to get down to the plot on Monday and what I'm doing at the moment, most of the time on the allotment, are clearing pepper beds and getting them replanted with spinach, lettuces, turnips, radishes and things like that. So when I clear the beds, what I like to do is just cut the top of the plant off, leaving the roots in the ground. And I do that with my big pruning shears. And it doesn't really take very long to get those beds cleared uh, in that way. It's certainly a lot easier than cut, digging up the roots, etc. And I just leave the roots in and the roots will rot down. One of the problems with doing that though is that when you're planting something quite densely, say in this case I was planting spinach, there's nowhere for the roots of the spinach to go when you've got all these roots from the peppers in there. 
And so I, I've got two strategies for that. One is that I dip holes with my fork, old fork handle, and that allows me to push down really hard and push the roots of the peppers out of the way. So that's a good strategy. And the other thing is I put about an inch, an inch and a half, something like that, of compost down. And this time I put well rotted cow manure down. And as a result of that, you know, they've, you know, that's about the depth of the module. Of course, the roots find their way through the roots of the peppers. So once they've actually got rooted, it's no problem at all. Anyway, I was pretty pleased to get that done. I've got four more of those beds to do. I'll do another one later on in the week, I think. So I took the cover that was on those peppers and I popped it on top of my spinach and spring onions and overwintering onions bed. And really the spinach doesn't need any protection at this time of year. Um, but in a few weeks time, it's gonna get colder and spinach does grow a lot faster when it's a bit warmer. It doesn't want to be too warm, but the chances of that are pretty slim at this time of year. Um, but, you know, it, it likes the weather to be effectively the middle of spring. That's, I think, when spinach is growing at its absolute optimum. Um, and obviously the middle of October and going into early November, that does not feel like the middle of spring. So my low tunnels effectively just boost the temperature just that little bit and the spinach just really well, just rockets away. So on Tuesday, I followed my rainy day routine, Cafe Nero and the health club. And when I got back, I was hoping to get out again and go for a, a long walk, but unfortunately it was not to be because of the rain. So I decided to clean house. That's a funny topic, perhaps for a gardening video, but I think that what I found is that once you get, if this is a job you don't like very much like cleaning, get good at it, <laughs> so, so pay, pay attention, learn how to do it, get good at it. And it's hard to dislike a job that you're good at. So now I actually really like the cleaning, but I did have a slightly tough decision to make on Tuesday as well, which is, should I leave the cucumbers in the conservatory or compost them? And in the end, I decided to compost them. It's a sorry tale really. One of the challenges when you do your late cucumbers is that they can get too hot in September and at that time they just don't have enough root to support all of the leaf growth and so they wilt really badly and so in order to try and save them because they were wilting really badly I gave them a really good water and then of course it was then cloudy and rainy for the next 10 days and they were just sitting in this absolutely soaking wet compost for that period of time. And they just really never recovered. I think the roots, whatever the roots they did have kind of started to rot away or something, I don't know. But they just looked really sickly. And as a result, they started to get more white fly. They'd got a little bit earlier on, but they started to get a lot more white fly. By Tuesday, I just yeah, cut my losses. Um, I don't mind, we've had cucumbers for such a long time. It would have been nice to have them for another six weeks or so. But anyway, we're in the compost now. So on Wednesday, I managed to get up in the hills. I went to the Rivington Reservoir System. It's a beautiful place. I love walking there. And one of the friends that I normally go with, he wasn't available, so I went on my own. And I took the opportunity to do some walk and talk podcasts. Now, a lot of people are asking me all the time to sort of do more uh, videos about the local scenery and all of that sort of thing. So I thought well, I'll take the opportunity while I'm on this walk to just film some of the Rivington Reservoir system as I'm walking and chat about various different topics. And so I've done those in two ways. So there'll be a video version of those walks and there'll be a podcast version of those walks. Obviously the video one you'll see the scenery. On the podcast one you just get my voice and the nature sounds. And we'll see how they work. I don't have a gimbal, so I can't hold the camera as steadily as I would like. Although I do have optical image stabilization on the camera. So it, they're reasonable, they're not brilliant. And uh, you know, if you want to get, if, if they get any traction at all, <laughs> and you can bear them, um, and you find them moderately interesting, then I might invest in a gimbal uh, so I can do a better job uh, in the future. Anyway, so again, give me some feedback in the description on those videos. And as I say, 
might invest in the gimbal if it's worthwhile. So on last week's video, I was talking about the problems with our water supply and how low it is. And we did get an email from United Utilities saying that it's still really low. We still got to save water, but the reservoir levels are at least rising again, albeit moderately. So it was really nice in the Rivington Reservoir System, which serves the sort of Liverpool area, to see that actually those reservoirs are pretty well stocked. And there's a fabulous cafe in the centre of the uh, Rivington area. And go there every time I go for a walk, really. It's one of the highlights of the walk. And I, while I was there, I finished the book, um, The Living Soil Handbook, which I really enjoyed. I'm not sure I'd recommend it for allotment sort of casual growers, but if you're really interested in small scale farming, which I am, although I'm never going to be a small scale farmer, but I like taking hints and tips from small scale farmers. And there's quite a lot of science in the book as well about living soils and that sort of thing. It's quite a nice book. Um, I did kind of do a little bit of a write up of my approach and my understanding really of how the soil science translates into the way that I garden um, and I might make that public at some point. So one of the chapters in my book is about how much space you need to be self-sufficient and obviously you can scale that down if you don't want to be self-sufficient just to get an idea of how much space uh, you need to grow the sort of volume of veg that you're interested in. And one of the viewers asked me how much undercover space they should have. And I don't have an answer to that. So I updated that section of the book with a new section um, that covers that topic and allows you to kind of take the amount that I've got and scale it up and down to suit your needs. So on Thursday, I was back on the allotment and main job really was to get that low tunnel repaired that uh, the fabric had the polythene had disintegrated on. And while I'd got that off, I thought, well, it's a lot easier to harvest the peppers and get that bed replanted without a cover on it. So I got that bed done and it's all planted now with lettuces uh, interplanted with spring onions. So I'm really pleased to have got that done and then I got that cover on. I've put a lot of these covers on over the years and I get better every time. And uh, I think it's only something about five minutes this time. So it's a pretty quick and easy job. Then I did repairs on all of the other low tunnels because there was a few rips and holes. One of the problems that I've got is cats really like climbing up the low tunnels. And, you know, if you look carefully on them, you'll see lots of little pinprick holes in the shape of a cat's paw where it's grabbed into it and climbed up. And it's really annoying. <laughs> so while I'm on the subject of low tunnels, I think it was last week I did write a chapter in my ebook uh, about how to make frames and all the various different types of covers that I've got. And I drew all these little pictures and I've got to say I really enjoyed doing all of the little diagrams. So if you want to understand how I make all of my different frames and other structures and things on the allotment, that's all fully documented now and there's videos and diagrams for all the different types. So again, link in the description to that if you want to take a look at that. And then finally, I've been working in the garden for the rest of the time and gave the lawns a good trim and harvested, I forgot this bed of spinach that just didn't grow. It grew to about this big and then it just stopped. And it's just been like that for a month. And I kept on waiting and waiting, thinking, well, surely it's going to spring to life, but it didn't. And I pulled it up today and there was no problems with the roots. There's a nice big root system. I have absolutely no idea. It's been the weirdest year for spinach that I can ever remember. We grow a lot of spinach, loads of successions every year. I did nothing different to this bed. It just didn't grow. We had two successions that went to seed over summer, uh, both varieties that are not meant to go to seed that we grew perfectly successfully in previous years. And then this bed that grew, didn't go to seed. It just stopped, just didn't grow at all. And it's been great weather as well for spinach. I just don't understand it. So anyway, took that out. Um, also planted in that bed some garlic. And in one of the other beds that I cleared, I planted collards. And I've never grown collards before, but we do like loose leaf cabbages. So um, I'm pleased to have got those in. I also took the beans out. 
I think you know now we're heading into a week of um, sort of temperatures sort of seven degrees, eight degrees centigrade. The beans are just not going to grow uh, at that sort of temperature, and the temperatures are only going to go down now. So I harvested all the beans that were left. There was actually quite a few, but there was no little beans. There was no flowers. So I think that's finished. And I took the opportunity actually to upgrade my lighting in the garden. Um, we've had lighting in the garden all this year and it's been amazing. We've really loved it. Um, but one of the things we do like to do in um, the evenings with the grandkid is play football and various other games, tennis and whatever. Um, and so I've moved the lights that I had uh, in another part of the garden and used them now to floodlight the uh, football pitch effectively and it looks great when i sit in this conservatory where i am now and look out in the garden once it's dark it's so, it looks obviously so gloomy uh, but now i've got the lighting in there it just lifts it and it just really makes this conservatory a much nicer place to be in uh, once the sun's set so i'm really pleased with that and i'm now i think fully planted in the garden i don't think i've got anything else that i can plant uh, I've got one more thing to harvest, which I'm going to do in a few minutes time. And that's the last bed of beetroot. All of our beetroot, other than that, is in store now. I'm going to put this in store as well. And I'm not sure what the harvest is going to be like. It's a difficult bed to get access to because it's underneath a cherry tree. It's difficult to manoeuvre. Uh, so I haven't really had a look, but there's a lot of leaves. <laughs> but I'm not sure whether there's much beetroot. So uh, you'll see that in a minute. And we did also harvest all of the uh, stems of the ginger and Debbie made some uh, stem ginger cordial with those and she's also fermenting the leaves and then she's going to dehydrate those and make a ginger tea and she's done quite a lot of other preserving actually some uh, really nice um, pickled cabbage which looks absolutely beautiful and another I think it's a chili sauce or something like that and the colour on that is just amazing really some really beautiful preserves she's done this year it actually brings to mind that we do have a preserves database which i'll put a link to in the description um, and that covers all the different preserves that we make there's so it's every batch of preserves uh, and then there's a link to the uh, ingredients and the recipe that we use to make those preserves and it's quite a big collection there um, and there's a chapter in the book as well about the preserves. So whichever way you go in the description here or through the book, you'll get to the same database. And one of the things I did last week was I harvested the field bean tips and I've actually got two trays so I could show you what happens when you harvest the field bean tips. So the first tray, this one, is uh, what the field bean tips looked like last week. And then I took the tops off, just snipped them off uh, with scissors and they just re-sprout and so this is the tray that I harvested last week and you can see now just um, the degree to which it's re-sprouted and that tray is actually inside so it's re-sprouted re within a week um, the ones that I did outside they'll probably be two or three weeks now uh, before they've sort of re-sprouted to the same level and they'll probably be about a month before they're ready for harvesting again so the other thing that I thought you might like to see are the peppers that were harvested green last week with just a tinge of colour on them, on the skin. And we put those with some ripe, in it, ripe apples, uh, just not in any sun or anything like that, just in a, a warm spot in the hall. And this is what they look like now. And I'm pretty pleased with them. They look pretty ripe now. Uh, so that's just a week from harvest green to ripe now uh, and so we just do that consistently as soon as we see a pepper that's got any color on it we just ripen it at home they're all going for cooking obviously we've got some that we harvest ripe as well um, but uh, at this time of year they need the warmth uh, to get ripe and I think they just ripen better off the plant and since I've got two beds still to harvest I got hundreds of peppers still to harvest so this is the way we're doing it so let's just run through what i sowed this week so i sowed broad beans and i actually module sowed those because i'm only doing 24 per succession and i'm going to do three maybe four successions 
uh, separated by about two weeks. I just want to try and stagger the harvest a little bit because we do get a bit overwhelmed with broad beans and then we like them, but we just don't want them all to come at the same time. So the first 24 broad beans um, and then fill basket Brussels sprouts. Now I do these for an early harvest of leaves in the sort of May, June, July period. We like the more northern cabbages. And so I sowed 27 of those in three, nine modules with three seeds in each. Uh, next batch of the Marathon um, Calabrese and the Snowball Cauliflowers. And my first batch of garlic in the ground and another batch in modules as well. Again, I'm trying to get those a little bit earlier. They might go in the polytunnel or not, might go in a low tunnel, I'm not quite sure. And then just another batch of lettuce. And I think that's probably the end of the lettuce for me. Maybe you do one more batch in November, I don't know. Um, and I started the microgreen peas, which we do on the windowsill in the kitchen. So that's why I sowed this week. So then I did the collards. I think there's four different varieties of collards in the back garden. And the garlic, as I mentioned, the white Lisbon uh, spring onions that were interplanted with the Grenoble red lettuce. Two batches of radishes and the giant winter um, spinach. So that's pretty much everything that I got planted. So all that remains now is for the harvest. So I'll just switch over to the harvest video and um, yeah, we'll see what we got. So here's the harvest table. And I'm having to be a little bit careful now so that I don't run out of food over the next two weeks. So I've got a lot of late summer autumn planted veg that is not on the stream yet and so I don't want to kind of over pick the beds and then get short you know just for a few weeks uh, in that transition anyway let me just talk you through what we've got so we've got the last of the beans got some just apples fusing this week cookers and eaters some pears these are some of the preserves we did this week so we got uh, ginger and lime syrup, ginger tea, and I don't think we did any jams or anything else this week. So we've just got a few potatoes um, and one of the first crown princes. And I think we've got enough crown princes for this much every two weeks until we have the early courgettes in June. And we've got lots of little courgettes here. We're just picking all the little ones at the moment. Um, otherwise, I think the good chance will just go rotten. And we've got some parsley, turnips. And let's just talk about the peppers. So those peppers last week looked like that. So basically that's what we're doing at the moment this year. Um, we are picking them just as they're turning. And you know, a pepper that's like that, just, just turning, will be you know, like that in a week's time. And we just put some apples in there and put them in the hole. And we are picking some green ones. We don't, Debbie and I don't really eat green peppers, but and lots of other people that we do. And I've actually given away probably at least that many peppers this week as well. Um, people on the allotment really like green peppers. So we've got through a heck of a lot. And some uh, parsnips, juice of artichokes, uh, leeks, Carrots, that's actually the first pick from my autumn carrot bed. So I'm really pleased with those, They're looking excellent. It's always a bit nerve wracking when you pick your first carrots, knowing that they've got to last you all the way through autumn and into early, let's have a look at those again, into sort of early winter. And then we'll switch over to the winter carrot beds. And I'll do probably a test harvest of the winter carrot beds in a few weeks time just to see how they're going. Spinach, various different types, pat choy and tatsoi, uh, blown sprouts and collets, 
and all the different brassica leaves. I don't know, I was counting off, I think I've got about eight different types of brassica leaves. We've only got a few red cabbages left now, so we're pickling some and just harvesting those over the next month. So that, I think, is pretty much it. It's quite a nice table, it's pretty colourful. Try and keep the colours going for as long as we can. By the time we get into winter, it's looking a bit green and orange, really. And he also picked this little bonus harvest of beetroot. That's the last beetroot that we had in the ground. Red beetroot, anyway. And they're <laughs> pretty big. Um, but they should be okay. I think I'll do a test and cut one of these up just to see how tender it is, but I'm pretty hopeful they'll still be lovely and tender. Even giants like this one. And I've just got some beetroot and onions and shallots out of the store. So here's the salad table and I'm having to be really careful with the amount of salad that I'm picking this week. I've got loads of salad just planted out, but the uh, summer planted beds are starting to slow down a bit now and I don't quite have enough for everybody uh, so uh, I've got enough just for family we've got some nice grapes off the vine outside and some radish cucumbers I keep saying that these are the last tomatoes probably the last tomatoes and just a few uh, salad onions for me and I really am hoping that we'll have spring onions soon. I think um, definitely next week. So there we go, that's it. With all the homegrown ingredients, we have to add some stuff from the shops now, unfortunately. A few extra tomatoes, some cheese, pear, all done. So I hope you liked this quick video. My name's Steve, this is the Seaside Kitchen Garden and Allotment Channel, and I'll see you soon.